Hello, welcome back. So, um, <clears throat> I did uh, some more rule checking and learned a few more things, and uh, we need to uh, step back a second. And what I did was is I moved some of my starting choices around. So the first big revelation are these two numbers with the slash. So the way it works is a German's going to show up in these approach boxes. And these approach boxes are considered to be their own location. So this approach box here is surrounded by this location, for example. And then what they're going to do is they're going to proceed to move into the next location as long as any adjacent location, which is only this one, does not have ranged shooters. So let's say that they did do that. They would move into here and then they would occupy this. Once this is occupied, we can never take it back. So that's part of the game is if you give up territory, you're never getting that territory back. Now, it's not a super big deal uh, because now if they try to move again, they can't move anywhere there's a character. They have to kill him or eliminate him or move him somehow. Also, he wouldn't be able to move because somebody with a ranged weapon is next to him. So that would prevent him from moving. Now, you may have remember from the setup video or, or if you skipped it, what I did was I originally put him there uh, and it was going to prevent, you know, anything from coming through. But what I did was I moved him over, and here's why. This number to the left of the slash benefits us. So we get to, you know, add up how many dice we get to roll and then kill Germans, right? And then after we're done with our attack, this number two here on the left side means we get to roll two more dice. It's at the very end. It's not character dependent. So every character does their own attack, blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't matter how many characters are in the space. As long as one is, we get to roll two extra dice at the end. So it's just one final, one final chance to hit somebody. The, so the converse, as you might be guessing, is the two on the other side is their benefit. benefit. But here's the deal. We, let's say I'm here and I'm attacking somebody here. I get to use this two to benefit me when I'm attacking, okay? He uses the benefit of where he, where I'm located, so, or where he's located. So if he's here, he gets the two, because that's his benefit. And um, unfortunately, we would uh, get no benefit being there, but he gets a two attacking us. Let me, let me make sure I got that right. Um, One on the left is used by British units, one on the right is by Germans. Roll d6, each die. It's the modifier of the square they occupy, not the square they are firing at. So that part's fine. Oh, that's the thing. The Germans use the modifier of the square they're firing at. So they would get a one bonus here instead of a two, which is better, right? So, so basically, I guess what this emulates is um, Reynolds here is not standing in an open field. Instead, he's hiding in this barn and shooting from the barn, and that's giving him some cover. So that's what that emulates. And maybe these logs here, the Germans were able to get behind the logs so they have cover, but we don't. Uh, that's, you know, the bank confers a nice bonus. Uh, the newspaper is perfect. We get a bonus and they get none. So that's a, like a great place to make a stand is at the newspaper. So I had the similar issue over here. You can see there the main road is really good. Um, I had put somebody down here um, off camera and then realized, nope, I'm moving them back. I definitely don't want to try to control surgery lane. The cricket pitch is crazy. Uh, that one is a three slash three. So that's just carnage for both sides, which I guess makes sense. It's an open field. And then the bridge is also bad. It's a two slash two. Whereas if you look at the schoolhouse, it's a two slash zero. So we may want to move and retreat one space and let them get the bridge and then pick them off as they're crossing the bridge. That's always an option. Okay, so um, that was it in a nutshell. The other things are there are special abilities that each character has in the game. So we're going to have to review those. I don't even remember what they are, but they're very important. 
Um, the next thing is our weapons have special rules. So these are like the special weapons, but you'll notice that the uh, gammon, which is the um, one of the grenades we have, the mills is one of the grenades we have, and then the gull is that Molotov cocktail. The gammon is a one-use item, so it stinks. So this guy here is not going to be very good. Um, the, um, the mills you can use many times, but after uh, you use it, you roll a die, and if you get a one or a two, it's gone. So um, I guess it emulates a box of grenades. And then the gammon, or the de Gaulle, is the same deal. You roll a die, and on a five or a six, you return the equipment container uh, if school or garage is in British hands. Uh, otherwise, they're permanently removed from play. Now, equipment container means it goes back in the draw bag. So that doesn't mean you're ever going to draw it again. Uh, the grenades in this game are not very <coughs> good. We want rifles. We want rifles. We want rifles. Okay, so let's start this game. So there's a pre-invasion segment. This happens even before turn one. And I guess it, you know, it's you can consider it as just an extended part of the setup. So um, what it says we're going to do is we're going to draw an equipment counter, and then we're going to roll a d6. And if it's greater than the current pre-invasion turn number, so the pre-invasion turn number right now is 1, then we're going to advance the turn marker one space, and then uh, basically the pre-invasion's over. If the result is less than the current pre-invasion turn, the number, uh, the invasion is underway. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. So, um... So basically, they're asking us to, this is what they're asking us to do. This is the invasion imminent track. They're asking us for the pre-invasion phase to just move this along. And then once we finally roll a die that's lower than the number, everything's going to reset back to one and we're going to start the game for real. Um, this is a situation where we want the pre-invasion to last as long as possible because we're going to get to draw some weapons and stuff. So, um, trying to just realize he starts there. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is let's draw and see what kind of weapon we get. We get a minus two GD GTM fortify. What the heck? Um, all right, so this little book in the back has a description of what those are, and <coughs> these markers reflect the various improvised efforts to reinforce key defensive points around the village. In the church, the organ was used to barricade the door, whilst cricket pads were nailed across the windows of the cricket pavilion. If a fortified marker is drawn, place it in any space containing friendly units, for as long as it is in the place of the germ for as long as it is in place, reduce the German terrain modifier in the square by two. Immediately, any German entering a unit enters a square with a fortify marker, it's returned. So, so what we get to do is we get, this is a minus two to the German marker. So there's a couple places that are really nice to use it. Uh, one would be the cricket pitch, but I think the best one here is the bridge. So we put it there and now the bridge, they have a zero for their marker. So uh, that's pretty good. We just fortified the bridge. That's pretty thematic. And then we also get to move any character anywhere we want. Um, not gonna do that. I'm gonna leave everything be. Although I am tempted to move out of the cricket pitch. I'm not sure the cricket pitch is a safe place to be for him. Uh, Cause he gets a, they get a three on their opportunity to hit us. but. Uh, I'm going to leave it be for now. Oh, and then we have to roll a die. So, um, I believe it says if it's greater than, we just advance by ones, which as long as we don't roll one, we're going to be fine. And I rolled a five. So, we move this to two. And now we go again. And let's get, let's hope for a nice weapon here. I think we can skip that, uh, but let me read it. It doesn't say what happens when you get 
bogus items. If one of these markers is drawn and the respective piece of equipment is already in play, then the jam marker replaces it. The piece of equipment cannot be used until repaired. And it says if it's not in use, it's held there. So basically, if we don't have a Thompson anywhere, we keep it. And the very moment we get a Thompson, it's going to arrive uh, broken. But here's the issue I have is there is no actual battle yet. I mean, am I really... Yeah, I guess I do. So this was the crappiest draw of all time. So if we ever find a Thompson, it's going to be jammed. Okay, so now we're going to roll our die. And I rolled a one. So we've already ended this phase of the game. That was the crappiest start of the game ever. Okay, so we are now officially on turn one. And let's review the character abilities before we get going. So uh, Sergeant Drake, um, he can hunt for the chaplain. So um, remember, there's a traitor amongst us. So what, what he has to do is he would roll a die and it compares to a chart. And in the chart, um, if that chart matches uh, the character that he's also in the same space of, then uh, I think he detects whether or not they're the traitor or not. So... Um, uh, this game has a weird thing where, like, for example, uh, we may not like uh, the old lady here because she, uh, you know, Edith Finley is useless, right? She's the most useless character in the game. So, uh, actually, yeah, that's what I would have done. I would have moved Edith to his location during the pre-invasement phase, and then, <laughs> and then uh, Edith there would be, um, he can interrogate her, and... And so when he interrogates her, there's this chart. So he's going to roll, and he has to roll a three to, uh, to get a hit for her. Apparently, Arthur Pendrake is the most likely uh, traitor, which is interesting because he's the banker, and he's also a useless character. So during the pre-movement phase, we would have moved him there too. Let's put them both there. And so let's, let's see if we can get one of them to become the traitor. Um, now, why do we want this? Well, we have to uncover the traitor, or otherwise we lose points at the end of the game. So, um, and so what he does is he, um, instead of making a movement roll during the movement phase, he can identify him. So he rolls 2d6, and if it matches the character in Drake's square, uh, the chaplain has been revealed. Uh, and then no combat is initiated, etc. And so if the chaplain is ever revealed, uh, he or she <laughs> attempts to shoot their way to freedom. Mm -hmm. And then there's this big thing that we do. And, uh, and then we actually try to see if we can capture the chaplain. And then, of course, he could escape and all kinds of stuff. But it's all part of the uh, end game. And if we don't find the chaplain or remove the chaplain, uh, there are events in the game that can hurt us really badly. And, of course, at the end of the game, we lose points because they somehow sabotage. They're also trying to assist the Germans to get in. And the game book does say that the, that the police detective was alerted uh, 48 hours ago in advance of this invasion that there was something amiss and that there was a possible uh, chaplain or spy in the, um, in the mix. So uh, that's sort of... The police chief is going to be there to help us defend the area, but he's also um, uh, partially trying to find the traitor as well. Okay, so he's got like a multi-pronged uh, goal. Now, let's go back and look at the next guy. Arthur Pendrake is the banker. He can increase the stacking limit in his square by two. So he is not the worst thing in the world. So now we can have like more troops in the same space. <laughs> he's not the worst. Earl Thorncroft. Now that guy is right here. He was one of our free guys that we can move around anywhere we wanted. He gets a plus two terrain modifier dice when he's in the square. So 
So right there, you can see the main road says two slash zero. It's now a four slash zero. So he's awesome. Don't want to lose him. Reverend Barnstaple. Any die can be re-rolled when he's in the square. And of course, he's in the church. Um, Dr. Greystone. Uh, he can heal in his square on a roll of a six. Five or six if he's in the surgery. So we sort of want to keep him in the, in the surgery. And we don't want to let the Germans take the surgery. James Arnold. He can fix weapons in his square on a roll of six or a five or six in a garage. So that Thompson jam that we got there, he's going to be able to fix that. Drayden Fox, he's the uh, newspaper reporter. He rolls a 2d6 and can boost morale, uh, which is a plus one terrain modifier. Um, so if we roll a 2d6, what, how does that happen? I think we have to look at the, uh, see it says more details on character traits is page 50. So we'll go check that out. Reynolds. Uh, German terrain modifier is minus one when he's in the square. And Reynolds is right here. See that barn is a two slash one. It's now a two slash zero. So see how we're we're maximizing the uh, terrain modifiers? Miss Featherlake, she's the uh, teacher. Uh, roll 1d6, six produces a de Gaulle cocktail. So that's awesome. Um, fighting spirit. Add one hit to any successful close combat attack from her square. So Betty Tanner... She's the uh, bar owner, and basically she knows how to get up close and personal. Edith Finley. If she's in a square, you may reroll any unsuccessful chaplain roll, because she's the gossip. So um, we actually put her in the square. <laughs> um, and then Daisy Woods. Roll a 1d6 can move through German-occupied squares, which is something that nobody can do. So um, that's really good. Let's see if we can find more information on that one ability. So it said page 50 here. So um, there's a lot of flavor text and it does get annoying when you just need to find the, the what you're trying to do. But um, which one was it that we were trying to get more information on. I think it was, oh yeah, Drayden Fox, the propaganda. Where is he? Right here. At the start of any British combat phase in which he is in the square, Roll 2d6. If the roll is greater than the current invasion marker number, add 1 to the British modifier for his square. Okay. So... See, and it gets interesting, because they all have, like, ifs. Like, if this one's doing a ranged combat, this one is um, in the recovery phase, you roll 1d6. So... It's really, um, it'd be really nice to maybe make a new card. Because, like, this doesn't say in the recovery phase is when you do the roll. So you have to, like, remember which phase of the game. So we're going to be coming back to this quite a lot to see when they do their rolls. Uh, but I hope you can appreciate there's a lot of flavor to this game. And each of the characters is offering a lot of, a lot of variety. And then also uh, there are certain bonuses based on their location. And again, the tower defense element is strong uh, by having spots that are uh, more defensible than others. Okay, so we're on turn one. All right, so turn marker phase, it's skipped in turn one. So we're gonna skip this in turn one. That's where we would advance the turn marker. The strategy event phase is again, skipped in turn one. Equipment phase, weapons and other equipment are drawn and supplied to the village defenders. So, um, unfortunately, we now have to flip to that. So, the equipment phase is you draw one equipment counter from the equipment container, and it must be placed in a church, okay? For an equipment container to be drawn, at least one British unit must be present in the church. Number of pieces have been sabotaged by a traitor amongst the villagers. This was known as codename Chaplin. Okay, then that, that's why. It, it's not some weird British word. It's just a code name. 
If a sabotage counter is drawn, immediately place it back in the equipment container and move to the tactical event phase. Note if Chaplain has been revealed, all the sub sabotage counters drawn are permanently removed from the module. So, um, so that's part of our risk. And you saw I drew a jam token, which they're not always good. So let's draw one and hope we finally get a good one. And we got a grenade, which isn't the most exciting thing in the world. So we'll put the grenade down and let's go back. Okay, so we skip tactical event, character event, British movement. Uh, village defenders do not move. The German placement phase. New German units are placed on the board. So we got to do that. Then we're going to do German movement and then combat and German advance and then recovery. Okay, so all this is happening in turn one. So um, that's later in the rule book. So we get to German placement. So um, you can see here the invasion marker has to be on two in order for the seventh Flieger Corps to arrive. We are on turn number one. So even though it said uh, there's a German placement phase, there's actually no German placement in turn one. It's the craziest thing. Um, and uh, so what it says here is you, as the marker advances, representing the advance of the German landing forces, the number of units assaulting, it's the invasion marker position. Our invasion marker is on one. So we're not even on two yet. And uh, so uh, nothing's coming out. And I don't think anything ever will. That's sort of a silly part of the rules. Um, and let me make sure I did this right. Return the turn marker to turn one. Place the invasion marker. Oh, and space two. Never mind. Never mind. I, I misunderstood. This starts in phase two, because that was the pre. Okay, so uh, we do do something. So let's go back to the do-do. All right. Okay, so I can tell you with high confidence that only the seventh Flieger Corps are coming out, because you can see the two plus here. So uh, basically, once a regiment is activated, it's in play for the rest of the game, meaning that the Seventh Flieger Corps is going to be in destroyed German units are recycled, so basically they're unlimited. So don't get your hopes up. Uh, so German initial plays is conducted for each activated regiment in turn. Okay, get on with it. Using activated units not previously placed. Uh, identify which regiments are about to be activated using the German availability table. Okay, done. We know it's going to be the Seventh Flieger Corps. Roll a 2d6. Okay, so we have on this side a German assault direction table. So we're going to roll a 2d6. It's turn one to three, and then we're going to get, you know, one of these uh, numbers, right? So let's say we roll a five. That means they're going to be attacking from the north. Does that make sense? So, um, so let's here. You can see it. this tells you the map edge the unit will enter from. So we roll. I rolled a six. So we come back over to here, and we find the six, and you can see they're coming from the west. Okay? How many are coming from the west? So then we roll again and compare it. Uh, so we're going to roll again. I rolled a five. So, oh, sorry, I rolled a five. So what it's saying is, is this thing's moving. So they're gonna be coming from up there. Okay, now we get to roll a third time and compare it with the German squad assault table. This indicates how many units are going to arrive there. So we roll a third time. And I rolled a seven. So we go to German squad assault. And you can see that I rolled a seven. So there's going to be three units that are coming. So sevens are not good. Um, there are worse <laughs> options. So we come over here. 
and it's pretty easy to find them. These are the Seventh Flieger Corps, and so three of them are coming, and they're going to show up in that box. Um, so they're going to show up here, and I'm pretty sure I know the movement rules, but I'm going to check it real quick. So then they're going to advance. So if they came from the north and the south, they're always advancing vertically towards the church. If they came from the east and the west, they're always going to advance horizontally towards the church. And then uh, they're going to move into um, the squares, these corner squares, to uh, take the church. Their goal is they want to take the church. Okay, so this one is going, these guys are going to move here, and it was uncontested because there was nobody next to them. And so they're going to guarantee they've already taken one location. So that location's out of the game. Uh, I'm not crying about it because I had no intention of defending a marsh. So they can have the marshland all they want. Um, okay, so a couple rules. They're never going to move more than one space, even if all the spaces are open. So if there was a pathway all the way to the church, they're still going to cautiously move because they're concerned about uh, being attacked. Okay, and that was specifically in the rules. The second thing is, is if he does want to move again a second time, he can't for two reasons. Number one, we have this guy here with the Lee Enfield. Okay, he's got the rifle and he has a range shot. Uh, he's on the bridge and he's able to shoot him down as they try to cross the river. The other one is the pub is filled with a lot of angry patrons and they have to actually kill everybody in the pub. The pub has to be empty before they can move to the pub. That's, that's the bottom line. Now, if they wanna, let's say the pub was empty. The, the guy on the bridge still can prevent them from moving and what they're gonna do is they're gonna roll a die and, and they have these numbers on them. See this number five? So it's an infiltration check. So they have to get, I think, less than a five on their die roll, which is pretty easy to do. It's a six-sided die. But if they got less than a five, they would be able to move, even mm -hmm. though the guy on the bridge is firing at them. So uh, they, they're not stopped permanently because somebody with range attack is mm -hmm. next to them. So the best way to prevent them from moving is to just be in their way. And so, um, like I said, uh, the pub is preventing them from moving, and so we got them cornered. Um, so it just asks, you know, who's eligible, blah, blah, blah. It's explaining that the approach boxes are not adjacent. Uh, then they move in the German unit phase. Uh, and what they're saying is that, um, so for the example, this approach box right here, they're saying that it's, a, it's adjacent to Bridal Path, but it's not adjacent to the barn because this is surrounded by this one. And then once they're here, then they're adjacent to us. So that's all that's trying to explain. And they move by advancing a single square and stopping. If it does not already contain a German control marker, it places one. Uh, if there's no German control markers left to place, they win the game. We lose immediately. Okay, they can do additional movement. Uh... that ends the German, oh, can they really go all the way to the church? It says single square and stopping. I guess they do keep moving. My apologies, I explained that wrong. Okay, they move towards the church, their ultimate objective, uh, along an LOA. If you were initially placed in the northern and south boxes, you always move vertically. The units initially placed in the eastern and western always move horizontally. German units only ever move along their line of advance. Once initially placed in the box of Hangman's Line, it would have the line of advance. Okay. Um, as soon as a German unit moves adjacent to any of the squares that are near the church, that square automatically becomes the next square on its line of advance. So, so yes, I explained that correctly. 
it's going to come in there, it's going to move horizontally, and then once it's adjacent, and they never move diagonal, by the way, it's always orthogonal, and then once it's adjacent to that new northwest square, he'll go to pub lane and then come down. And if we let him get that far, we're losing this game. So we need to kill them now. All right, so um, I did print these things out, and I don't know if they're helpful. I remember when I printed them out, I thought they were awesome. Now I'm not so sure. Um, these are things that help you with, you know, what do you do? But I never... Yeah, so uh, this is a sort of helpful. During the British combat phase, you get one attack per turn, and then this is helping you to determine how you're you calculate your range attack and etc. But let's just let's just keep going. Um, the next thing up is we get to attack first. It's always us first, which is good. And range attack, uh, then close combat. Now it's gonna drive you a little batty, but close combat is done. So those bar patrons will do close combat with the Germans, even though the Germans are not in their square. The Germans are not allowed to move into the square with a British unit, period. So close combat is done. I guess it emulates their running towards the Germans and then doing close combat, like, I don't know, wherever they meet up. But it's the same as the ranged combat. The guy on the bridge is shooting at them from one square away. So basically the distance of the ranged guy is exactly the same as the distance of the close combat people. I know that sounds odd, but that's how it is. Now, the one thing is, is that the range guy has no chance of getting hit until the Germans go. The close combat people, however, uh, there is always a chance that they will get hurt uh, during the combat, whereas the range guy gets a free shot. No one's gonna hurt him until it's the Germans' turn, okay? So there is a lot of risk in doing close combat you don't have to do close combat because uh, this is our phase. We initiate whatever combat we'd like. Now, when the Germans go, they're going to shoot at whoever they choose. And there is an order, priority order for that. Uh, but um, right now, we don't have to risk the close combat if we don't want to. I honestly don't know what's the right choice. I can tell you that there's three German units there, and that's a lot. Until we, unless we roll really well. So let's, um, let's do our attack. And the attack is fairly straightforward. I'm going to grab my pencil if I can find it. I don't have a pencil that I can find, but I will do this. Okay, so what you do is you see this number two here at the top, and then this number one. He's going to get to roll three dice, which isn't super exciting. Uh, he is going to get to roll two more dice because... Uh, the bridge is just two dice at the end of his attack, right? Didn't matter how many characters were here, we get to roll two extra dice at the end. So um, he's going to roll three dice, and he needs to get... Normally it's a six hits, but with this gun it's very accurate, so he can do a five or a six hits. Um, every hit he gets kills one of them. So if all three of his dice hit, then he kills all three of them. Um, so we could get a miracle roll, potentially. And I'm going to just go ahead and roll uh, five dice because he's going to roll three for himself and then two for the bridge. Uh, the two for the bridge, uh, well, let me, let me look at that real quick. Okay, nope, I got to roll three and then two. Here's why. His gun is a 5 to 6 accuracy, but the bridge is only a 6. So the dice that I roll for the bridge, I need to get a 6 only. A 5 does not cut the mustard. Okay, so you can see the situation there. So let's get some rolling here. Let's do his three dice. And by the way, the game says that you can see the outcome of character by character before deciding what the next character is going to do. So that's a complete miss for him. Now, the uh, unfortunate part is I have to decide if these other characters are going to attack. I don't get to roll for the bridge until all this is over. So I have to decide what every character is going to do and then resolve it, and then I do the location bonuses. So 
I don't get to see the outcome of the two dice either. Uh, so good thing I checked the rules here. Okay, um, that was horrible. We missed with all three dice, and now uh, we gotta decide, are we gonna go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them? So let me uh, explain what the toe-to-toe -to -toe combat's gonna do. And uh, there's a whole anti-tank thing that I didn't even read. So uh, forgive me, when we get to tank combat, I'm gonna have to stop and read rules. But, um, Close combat is here, and uh, basically, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit in the first video, but they have a number on them, and you're going to roll two dice. So let's say the number was nine. Both of these dice need to equal nine in order for it to be a hit, or otherwise it's a complete miss. Now, if they have a weapon like a baseball bat or something in their hand, that weapon will also have a number. So you never want the weapon number to match the character number, because that's awful. <laughs> you know, having two numbers that are the same or is, is stupid. Um, but if the character has a 9 on it and the weapon had an 8 on it, then this would have been a hit. So now you have basically two numbers that you're trying to roll for. It's a very low odds attack. Uh, that one was a much higher odds attack, and it didn't do well. Okay, so then... Um, Um, so I explained how the hits work. Um, so then we get to roll a 1d6 for each German unit remaining in the square uh, that stayed alive. So we, we apply our kills first, and then we get to roll for them. So it's not simultaneous. Um, if they roll a 6, they damage one of us, which is not good. So um, let's make sure we have our character abilities mastered. We're going to be using this uh, pole girl. And I think Betty Tanner has fighting spirit. She gets to add one hit to any successful close combat attack from her square. So those bar patrons, are if, it, if the bar patrons hit or if she hits, she gets to add an extra hit. So we would kill two of them. So I think it's worth doing. So let's try it. Okay, so I'm going to move you back up here. Let's look at the situation. Uh, we got to make sure everybody's equipped with stuff. So her close combat attack value is nine, okay? Uh, the bar patrons have an eight. And you can see here, there's bottles for five. So we'll give them to the bar patrons and she'll take the darts. And why are we doing this? Because the bar patrons can actually equip three items, if you remember. And if they have the bottles and the darts, then it's useless because both of them have a five on them and that's a stupid thing for us to do. So by giving them the pool cues and the bottles, they can now hit on an eight, five, or four. So there's three numbers we can hit on. And then for her, she has a nine and a five. So there's two numbers. Now we got to do this one character at a time. So, um, Nope, it says one square at a time. I apologize again. So we get to do all of our attacks. And only if the Germans survive do they attack back. So this is sweet. I, I at least appreciate that part. So I'm going to roll two dice for the bar patrons. And I'm just going to roll right here. So there you go. I rolled a five. And kaboom. We hit. Because this bottle has a five on it. So we kill one. And then because of her ability, we kill a second one. So, uh, well done. Never mess with a bar lady. Okay, so now we're going to attack for her. And I rolled a 10, which is not enough. I needed a 9 or a 5. So one does survive. So he rolls one die. If he rolls a 6, it's bad news for us. Good. He rolled a 2, so he missed. So we killed two of them. And uh, I'm quite pleased with that. So now we do the... The, uh terrain bonus. And the terrain bonus is only useful for range attacks. So the pub terrain bonus doesn't matter, but we do get the terrain bonus for the bridge. And remember, if I, I need a six, so I have no sixes. So it doesn't do us any good. So 
it's his turn now. It's the German's turn. So now I'm moving to the German combat phase. German combat is resolved one square at a time. All units in a square uh, attack the same target. So then they have this priority. So let me show you the priority. They always attack the church first. The square that contains the most British units, which is going to be the pub. The square that's next in their line of advance, which is also the pub. pub. And then, of course, a square containing an anti-tank marker. Um, not an issue. A uh, square that was not previously fired upon. And now this is in order. So you just start at the top, and then once you hit one that matches, you stop. So technically speaking, we have to stop at the second priority. They're attacking the pub. So what they do then is we identify which regiment's going to fire first. It's the seventh. Uh, it's always the regiment with the most units in the square. Count how many units are firing. It's one. Then craft for the inference with the appropriate column of the German combat table. So we need to get the German combat table out. And here you can see there's one unit in the square. It's the seventh unit, so he has a factor of two. So these seventh units are actually pretty powerful compared to the other ones. Um, so his combat factor of two is, means he's gonna get to roll two dice. The other guys would've only rolled one. So, uh, so identify the terrain modifier. This is the number to the right of the slash. It is a one, because it's a two slash one over there for the pub. So add this to the German combat modifier. Um, so it's gonna be a three. Count how many German control markers are adjacent to the British square being targeted. There's one, because they have a German control marker where they're located. Well, hold on. Add this number to the German combat factor and the German terrain modifier to give the total number of German attack dice. So he's going to get four. And he's going to roll them, and every six is a hit. Uh, unlike German units, British units are not destroyed, blah, blah, blah. Um, so... Uh, it's a six. So we got to get... So he's going to roll four dice, and he needs a six. And let's hope he has just as poor rolling as we did. Oh my gosh, he rolled two sixes. That was awful. Absolutely awful. Okay, so we're going to take casualties. All hits on a British square are done in this order. Regular units and then home guard, villagers third, Sergeant Taylor, Captain McGowan, and then characters last. So the villagers are the pub people, so they're for sure getting hit. And then, um, and then it does say here that when you're distributing hits, if something is wounded, it never takes a second hit. It's always lowest priority. I don't think the regulars have an injured side. Oh, yes, they do. So both sides are now injured. And you know what? The only thing that really changed with them is they have less movement points now. But... Uh, Okay, that was one round. Um, I hope you're finding this enjoyable. It'll go a little faster because I've been trying to go through the rule book and make sure we get it right. And uh, it is a very, uh, I mean, it's an easy to read rule book uh, from a perspective. It's, it's hard to remember all the details because the details are buried. Um, so that's why I have to go through the steps like this. Uh, he also puts a lot of flavor which is sometimes very funny um, in the rule book, which is great, but sometimes I just want to see the rule that, that I need to know. And uh, so that part's a little bad, but uh, I, I think part of this charm of this game is it's all about the flavor. So uh, anyways, we are now at the recovery phase. So let me go to the recovery phase. I just spent all this time going backwards. Does he have? Nope, he doesn't. I was hoping maybe the last page had a... Well, there's a German advance phase. Uh, they would advance if the, the bar people would have been killed. They would have also infiltrated. They would have had to infiltrate because the guy on the bridge is actually preventing them from advancing. Um, but none of that's happening. 
Okay, so where is recovery? All right, so here, if there are any German units or control markers in the church at the start of this phase, the module ends. If this is turn 16, the module ends. If the German invasion marker is in position 15, the module ends. If the German invasion marker is in 14, uh, then we roll dice. Treat injuries. Injured British units may receive medical attention. Refer to an intelligence briefing for more information. Oh, come on. Does that mean... I think that just means that they can go to the surgery. Or I can try to move the uh, doctor to them and treat them. So maybe that's what I could do. Anyways, uh, I don't see... A treat injuries phase. I think they're referring to the doctor's special ability there. So that was a really poorly worded item. Uh, weapons maintenance may be repaired. Again, I think that's a... Well, so you can roll a 1d6 for each jammed weapon in a square with a British unit. And then um, uh, we could use so-and-so. I'm going to go back to the doctor again. Okay, so the doctor definitely heals somebody on a roll of six, or it's a five or a six, if, um, if he's actually in the surgery. Um, that's all I see. Okay, so then event resolution. Uh, British characters are in any attempt to rally. Uh, if this is the end of turns one through eight, and return time marker. All four primary defensive locations. I wonder what that is. Hmm. I don't remember what that is. But anyways, uh, return to the turn marker phase and begin a new turn. So we will go do that. So as you recall, we skipped a lot of steps the last time. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this video. And then we go to the next video. We are obviously going to start uh, a full turn with all the steps. So that will probably take just as long because we don't have to spend as much time going over combat, right? Which is probably the most complicated part of this. Uh, but we are going to have all these extra steps. We're going to have to figure out what to do. I have a high-level idea what they do, but like I said, it's a slow uh, game. And then eventually we're going to fly through this. So um, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you find this helpful if you somehow have this game and never bothered to play it. This is a very old game. I think it's even out of print. So uh, good luck finding it. Um, uh, I'll sell you my copy for 200. <laughs> um, no, I, I, and that's probably what you'll end up paying for it. So uh, anyways, um, uh, thank you for watching. Stay awesome.